Poštovani gledatelji, dobrodošli u emisiju Balkan u Evropi. Ja sam Ivana Dragičević. A ja sam Borjan Jovanovski. Socioekonomske i političke reforme ostaju ključ za uspješnu evropsku integraciju zemalja Zapadnog Balkana. Zaključak je to foruma Organizacija civilnog društva održanog ljetos u sklopu Bečkog samita, koji kaže kako taj proces može biti uspješan samo ako u njega bude aktivno uključen nevladin sektor. Koji su dosegašnji te rezultati? Koliko pari se vloženi v projektite na nevladini od sektor, kako i za iskustvata na oddelni zemlji i od regionot, koji sta na zemlji i členki na Evropska tunija, denerska v emisijeta Balkan v Evropa razgovarame so našite gosti. S nama je Ivan Jakovčić, zastupnik u Evropskom parlamentu, bivši hrvatski ministar evropskih integracija, Vistarski župan, dakle čovjek koji je puno radio sa, da tako kažem, evropskim novcem, sredstvima, nevladinom sektorom, mislim da će nam puno pomoći danas u emisiji. Od naša desna strana se lugeto so parite. Franz Karl Pruller, koji je predsedavač na bordot na Erste fondacijata, i Srđan Cvić, koji je od kancelarijata na Open Society Foundation, Do you have any idea how we call the people from the Soros Foundation in Macedonia and in some other uh, countries in the region? Mm. You say it. <laughs> Because the enemy of the state? Okay, yeah. let's start with Mr. Uh, gospodine Jakovčić, <laughs> dakle, evo, Hrvatska je zadnja članica iz regije. Croatia is the last uh, country from uh, our region who entered the European Union. Uh, we experienced the times when our former president was calling people from uh, NGOs red, yellow and green devils, if I can remember well. I was one of them. Huh? You were one of them. <laughs> I remember the, of the, pro- state. Yes, of the, the members of opposition and NGO sector, but basically when you assess it, you were there in this first four years of our accession period from Stabilization Association yes. Agreement up there. Uh, how important was the role of NGO sector in that? Because you were the so-called government which opened up to, to some processes. Uh, and what's your advice in a way to other Western Balkan countries how to treat NGO sector in this process? First of all, let me, let me say something about uh, the Soros fund, fund, Foundation. For me, it was very, really very impressive to have many times the opportunity to speak with many people, also with the, the President Soros, because I think that they can only help us on the Balkans. Because there are not any other ideas like uh, it's uh, business ideas for the Soros Foundation. It's just to help to really create a, a, a a human rights society, an open society, as the name of the foundation is. At, at that time, I remember how Mr. Soros helps uh, uh, mostly the, Ser- the Serbs community in uh, Croatia. And this was very important. Of course, it was very, very important at that time. But uh, without NGOs, it's not possible to live. There is uh, there are there are varieties of NGOs. Of course, we can we can uh, we can say something about uh, environmental uh, NGOs, uh, human rights NGOs, or uh, I don't know other type of NGOs. But the human rights NGOs, there are absolutely uh, the most important NGOs in, on the, on on the, in, on Balkan Peninsula because they are really helping people, and they are also uh, uh, showing that uh, uh, sometimes the governments are not uh, doing. Mm-hmm. proper and doing well and that's very important that we can with them together really solve the problems. Mr. Jakovic, uh, you've been uh, part of the enemy of the states in uh, 15 years ago, uh, supported maybe by some of the foreign fun- foundation. No, no, no. Or not, not uh, part no, of the no. civil society. No. And then you have, you, you became a, a, a vice uh, prime minister. Uh, in charge for the European integration. So how, how, you, how you observe from this distance the role of the civil society and, uh, and this partnership with the, with, the, with the government? In the 90s, as you know, the, the human rights problem was um, not a problem in Croatia because uh, there was really just uh, ig- an ignorance uh, uh, towards all the people working in the civil uh, civil. Uh, society. But uh, uh, after that, in uh, 2000, when Mr. President Rachan came to the government with us all together, uh, uh, we start to, really to openly work with the civil society. I will not say that we, uh, it was perfect, that every, everything was perfect. Of course, we, we had also problems. But on the end of the day, I can say that uh, especially in uh, some areas in Croatia, uh, 
let me say, in my area where I live and where I later was the president of the region of Istria, uh, we can say that really the, 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 the human rights are on a very, very high level. Minority rights, LGBT rights, uh, all type of human rights, we, we, we can say really are on a very high level. But from the other hand, I, I have to admit, also in many other parts of Croatia, we have uh, seen that the human rights are going really in, in a higher standard than, than previously. There is a strange phenomenon. People, once in the civil society, engage in the civil society, they are trying to, uh, to, 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 to have a, a good relationship, to influence the government. But then there are many cases. Once the very same people are within the government, within the institutions, they are completely changed their mind about, uh, about the, yeah, the but, role of the civil society. But, but, it's kind, kind of very controversial. Yes, yes, oh, of it course, is it's very personal. Of course, of course, of course. There are many cases like this, we know very well. Yes, probably in some part, uh, but I, I have to say now uh, I'm traveling uh, around the Balkans, around the countries, yeah. and I have uh, many experiences, especially in Serbia and Albania, because I am member of the board of the of the delegation of the uh, European Parliament uh, for uh, Albania and Serbia, and uh, we had meetings with uh, various NGOs, and we understand the situation in Albania and in in Serbia. I think that we have some uh, good processes but also some bad 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 things so we have to work with them and uh, I, I'm here to say very very clear we want all the uh, the, the Western Balkan countries in here with us in the parliament working with us and being also a full member of the uh, European Union but of course one of the biggest pressure will be uh, uh, the justice reform and human rights just to, to, yes. pass, to before we pass it to because we'll have you for the short time here you have to leave just one question as a local politician you were challenged by the NGO sector on the questions of uh, uh, environmental issues on corruption how did you dealt with that the best way is try to have an open discussion mm -hmm. sometimes this is not easy but i think that that's, that's the best way i always invite people to come and discuss let's go and see my arguments let's go and see your arguments if 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 we can reach an agreement that's the best way in many times we many times we reached some agreement sometimes not uh, the problem was let me say something uh, with with the environment environment is something also like a human rights huh? today environment is important and we had a problem with the uh, 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 uh a project in Istria, which is uh, uh, a coal, uh, um, coal energy thermal uh, um, uh, plumin to okay. be very clear. Okay, uh, and and uh, uh, we start to negotiate with uh, with the NGOs, but it was really very difficult because the third part, the government, never want to uh, uh, never want to accept that we change uh, uh, the. Uh, coal to uh, a gas plant. So this was one of the problems. And uh, I, I, I have to say that uh, um, sometimes it's not easy to, to find, a, to, to find a, a clear solution where everybody will be satisfied. Sometimes they, they exaggerate, let's say. M Could you say this? Maybe sometimes when, when you, you are in power, you know, you, you have to provide uh, 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 new working places. You have to provide uh, benefits for the people, for not just for two, three, four, five or ten. You have to provide benefit for thousands of people and sometimes you, 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 I can say that sometimes I was really not satisfied with some discussions. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Thank you, Mr. Hvala. Thank you. Mr. Krul, I just Hvala. wanted to ask you, in uh, Vienna we finally got kind of on the same level representatives of the governments and the NGO sector as the foundation was actively involved in organizing Vienna summit. Uh, so basically, what's the, what's the result of it after that? Because three, four months has passed. And uh, does all these governments understand how important it is to have NGO on the line, if not on the side, because it's always better to have a challenge for what they do? Definitely, I think they, they do understand, um, but it's a process, it's, it's a continuum, it's, it's uh, an evolving uh, process. Um, I'm very convinced and reactions we received after Vienna showed us that um, we have moved two or three steps forward uh, during that uh, meeting or with that meeting, because 
really for the first time, uh, members of governments from the Western Balkan countries and uh, NGO representatives, civil society representatives, set side by side in a panel discussion uh, that was televised, that was, that was broadcast, uh, that was recorded. So what, what they were saying, what the NGOs were saying is on record and uh, one can build on that. And this is, this is I think, a big achievement, even if uh, some were not too happy because the politicians had more time than the, the civil society representatives. Uh, the politicians were making uh, general policy statements rather than Concrete. Uh, uh, speaking yeah. to the the very specific points that the NGOs were making, but at least it, it was a beginning, it was a first step, and I think now the challenge is upon us and all participating um, politicians as well as civil society representatives to build on that and to move with that forward. And we are planning currently the next steps in the beginning of the year. We would like to involve uh, government officials from uh, Western European or Central European countries as well as government officials in, in the region as well as the NGOs, civil society representatives. And we're moving forward, we are getting support from the European Parliament, from the Vice President, Ms. Lunacek, who was present in Vienna, uh, also from our own foreign minister and the foreign minister in Germany. So we are really, I think, on the track to move forward with that now. The question yeah. maybe yeah. for both of you, is there, any, uh, is there enough kind of structural support for the CEOs who really des deserve to live and thrive? If you both as the donors at this, aspect of time, how, how can you, uh, in a way, uh, judge or how does don donors figure out today who to work with at these right, circumstances? Right. So maybe, maybe to, yeah, to, it's, it's a really important question and to go back also to something uh, Mr. Jakovic was saying, um, uh, when we think about the civil society in the Balkans, uh, we have to think about the situation in the past. So in the 1990s, we were facing with a unified bloc of civil society, fighting the war, nationalism, autocratic regimes. And for us, it was really easy to decide with whom we want to work and uh, which processes do we want to support. Now, situation is very different. Now, now we have um, organizations very active, very present on the ground, that maybe we don't really want them to be there, but they are there, like right-wing organizations. They reach very well to the grassroots levels, to the, to the citizens, to general population. Then we have, talking about the EU context, we have civil society organizations very active that are maybe not about the EU. They're not going around in their activities waving the blue flag with yellow, stars, but they're doing a really good job, like plenums in Bosnia, like Solidarnost in uh, Macedonia, like Nedavimo Beograd in Serbia. All these organizations are maybe not directly about literally, uh, you know, f fulfilling the criteria of the EU enlargement process. But even, you know, if you think about it, is the EU really an end in itself? Mm -hmm. No, it is not. We, we are not going to solve all, all our problems one day when we come, when we enter the EU and we, we become member states. Mr. Jakovic was talking about that. So I think, as Mr. Pruler said, democrat, democratization, open society is a goal we are all trying to reach, is a process. And we are really trying to get there. And uh, I'm really blessed to work with the organization that has local people committed working from 1991 on the ground that tell us what is actually happening nowadays in the civil society. And how, how, yep. what, 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 what you, you, you think that you should do in order to, to clarify kind of the confusion that exists on the ground between the various NGOs? Uh, because <laughs> very often uh, some say that this NGO is linked or is in service for this particular party, the others for the other, uh, let's say, governmental ruling parties. And it's a kind of mess right now. Right, right, right. The diversity right. that you mentioned. It's, 
Yes, um, but I think that's a natural state of affairs. Uh, it, it reflects the diversity also of the civil society sector. And I mean, if you look at, at other countries, I mean, you have a very broad spectrum. You have them from the very right wing to, to the very left wing. Um, you have them affiliated with political parties. You have them independent from political parties. You have them funded from within the country. You have them funded from outside the country. So I think this is a natural state of affairs of a, of a diverse, more mature um, civil society already. And, and we see this uh, developing in, in also the countries in the Western Balkans. Um, as as Sergeant was saying at the beginning, um, 20 years ago, it was relatively easy to identify the ones we wanted to work with. There were not that many. Now it's much more varied. How uh, do you identify it as Erste Foundation? How do you identify your partners in the Balkans? We, we look at issues. We look the, at the issues that we would like to support, like, like um, democratization, for example, like uh, um, a, an independent, uh, free press, uh, a professional investigative journalism in the, in the region, um, like uh, concretely working for minorities, um, marginalized people. So these are then uh, organizations we concretely approach, um, we, we work with, we develop programs together with them. And I think also here there is a change. It's no longer that there is a Western organization that is sort of handing down funds um, and have coming with a with a fixed idea or I'm not saying that you did that ever, but um, I'm just saying that, 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 that um, very often this was the case or very often it was perceived like that, mm -hmm. that uh, the, the Western civil society organizations, foundations, etc., had their programs and they were looking for partners to implement them. I think we are, we are in a very different state today. We're, we're meeting at eye level. We are co-developing, co-creating uh, projects and social develop, societal development. And uh, in that respect, I think we really are looking for partners with whom we can develop these things. We're looking for development partnerships where both of us can set goals and can develop towards that. There is no doubt that the Vienna, uh, Berlin process and Vienna summit is what the, the highest level of commitment towards the cooperation between the government and the, and the, and the, and the civil society. Right. Uh, but yeah, well, so. once you, uh, yeah, we, we got the prime ministers from all <laughs> countries from the Western Balkans committed there to cooperate with the civil society. But once you, 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 you define who is your partner, then what are you doing in order to protect your partner not to be blamed as an enemy of the state, like is the case in Serbia very often, and in mm. Macedonia especially? I, I want to make a point, though, what uh, Karl Franz was saying before. Uh, we never actually worked as a foreign Western organization mm, exactly. deciding that's really the very nature of our organization is that we have independent national foundations that actually tell us what they want to do, you know, so it's completely bottom up. And present you it's projects completely basically different. Right, on right, which yeah. you assess. But what to answer to your question before, it's I think the problem is really with the government. You, it's a really a worrying sign if the government see as their main enemy in the civil society. That's the problem. And it's also telling about the opposition. Because if the governments are more concerned about the civil society than the opposition, it tells us just about the sorry state of affairs of the opposition mm. in the region. I, I agree with Sergeant. I think if, if, if we have a situation where the government says um, it looks as, at civil society representatives as enemies of the state, then the government has a problem, not so much the civil society. Because but it's, it, it it's shows a, anyway, it's an obstacle. It doesn't matter who is wrong. It's an obstacle because there is no conf if there is no confidence between the uh, government and the civil society, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's difficult to expect any results out. But of that's related operation. to the so the the Berlin process and um, civil society forum in Vienna. Mm -hmm. that uh, was the first step mm -hmm. in the right direction. But really, uh, I think the main point is that also the European Commission in bilateral relations with the uh, accession countries, they have, they meet regularly with the civil society. They set a day, a meeting, uh, sometimes commissioner even comes. But I think we cannot really hope that uh, this cooperation will be uh, exhausted and really uh, 
let's say, meaningful if we meet a couple of times a year. I mm -hmm. think this contact has to be continuous. Mm -hmm. And it's not civil society organizations that should chase the representatives of the institutions, but it should be the other way around, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. And in, what, in, yeah. in which way, because you've mentioned uh, European institutions, and we know that the Commission looks very deeply into you know, the NGO sector's analysis and statistics when coming out with progress reports and, and things like that. Uh, so basically, in this new set of things, because before probably they just had you, as a donor, and now they have some EU funds also on which they can rely on in, in, in certain ways. Uh, but uh, in what way in this EU process can civil society influence the decision-making right. process right. So, in their respective fields? So, yeah, so uh, uh, we have, uh, in the region, we have a coalition, let's say, of NGO mm -hmm. think tank experts that are for years uh, doing shadow reports, for example, on um, chapter 23 on uh, judiciary and fundamental rights and they're doing this for years they're they're quantifying these reports for years so they, they have developed comparative transparent clear understandable language in which they are following the official EU progress reports. And it was really encouraging this year to see that the Commission followed suit. I think, you know, we have to give them uh, the benefit of a doubt. They did their best. Uh, uh, it was a shy attempt, I would say, and uh, more has to be done. And, and this is why I was mentioning the need to work continuously with the civil society, because we have people on the ground. It's just enough really uh, to rely on them and to work together with them. Before we well, continue, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another example also. Um, uh, the, during the Vienna summit, a paper was uh, accepted, adopted by the ministers, uh, which was a paper prepared by the uh, Balkans in Europe Advisory Group, which is uh, a joint effort of several European foundations uh, together. Uh, and that's a local think tank. Uh, and they presented a paper on bilateral conflicts uh, in the region, which was accepted as a, as a statement by the ministers and to work on. So again, here, this is a concrete uh, contribution uh, into a process by civil society and I think more and more of these examples are, are there and, and uh, in many of the, especially also the accession um, chapters and discussions, NGOs are playing uh, increasingly a role as, as, as people who are monitoring, as uh, controlling uh, factors in this, as contributing to the different discussions. And I think there we also see significant progress. But this is one part of civil society, of course. I mean, then, and then, as we said earlier, we have in the big variety that is now uh, existing, others who are taking a more antagonistic position um, and who, who see themselves more as, as advocates of those who are neglected, who are marginalized, who are outside the, the political or, or um, economic spectrum. Uh, my question is uh, this. You've mentioned other, uh, other subjects because basically it was always about democratization, human rights. That was kind of the basic idea of the public what NGOs are doing. But we have a huge issue in the region which is youth unemployment, which is, uh, you know, job creation, labor market issues. So how much does the NGO sector works on that agenda? Oh, very much mm -hmm. so. I mean, uh, the NGO sector in the region is extremely vibrant. I can give you several examples. On various topics, it's even more advanced than in some EU member states, in, in a lot of the EU member yeah. states actually. So for example, you have you know, a coalition fighting for online freedoms and digital rights in Serbia. So it would be something which you would typically not have at such level of development in, 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 a, in a big part of the EU. Or for example, uh, uh, coalition, uh, I'm Roma, I'm an Albanian citizen in Albania. The, the, they are really, they, they started off from, you know, fighting against forced evictions, 
for fighting for equality in the society. And really, their movement resembled uh, some kind, in a way, civil liberties movement in the US in the 60s, in the level of mobilization. And not only because only Roma participated, because have a lot of the uh, general population, they just uh, joined their uh, fellow citizens in the protests. And they're working a lot on youth unemployment as well, focusing on these topics. So the situation has evolved. Uh, a lot since the 90s, as we said before. So. There are some well, unfortunate... Tell, uh, about the economic yes. aspect, I yeah. think it's one of the important things we have to discuss. I think it, there also you have to look at, at the um, what is called social economy as well. I think the social economy is increasingly playing a more important part and there we basically have social service NGOs working in that sector, um, providing social services to the elderly, uh, to disabled people, etc. So this becomes a, an economic factor in itself because this is, these are services that are rendered for which um, people are also now paying, uh, for which health insurances are paying, pension funds are paying. So this is uh, again economic and economic economic factor in, in the society that is gaining importance, mm -hmm. where specifically civil society organizations also with their lobby work to improve services, mm -hmm. to, to um, allocate budgets uh, to this, are helping that this becomes a stronger and, and better uh, rooted economic factor mm -hmm. in society as well, where lots of people are beginning to find employment. either in their own home countries or increasingly also as caregivers, for example, abroad. But that means they have the possibility to earn money and to transfer that funding back to their own countries and families at home. Talking about checks and balances, maybe before NGO sector reacted, nothing happened. Is today the situation different? If you, I don't know, discover corruption within a government, if you put your finger towards this and that, you know, is now better? or it's still developing this kind of you know role of the ngos as check and balances yeah. of the government i think i think we are still in a critical phase mm -hmm. um, especially in a critical phase when you look at media freedom. Um, increasingly, the media in the region is owned by people with very clear political or economic interests. Um, and it becomes more and more difficult for uh, independent investigative journalists to set up uh, their own uh, reputation, to, to be able to be published, mm -hmm. to be read and seen uh, with their stories. And I think here, um, the role that foundations uh, like ours play, where we also closely working together in a program project that's called Balkan Fellowship for Journalistic Excellence, uh, based in Belgrade. Um, here, I think civil society organizations play an important role as a corrective. Sure, sure. Um, however, in, in, in other cases, I think uh, people begin to be more sensitized. And, and within the accession process, um, politicians have to pay attention to this. And we, the, the accession process gives leverage to those watchdog organizations that are observing what is happening in economy, in politics. Uh, and therefore, I think we are, we are gaining ground, but it's, it's an uphill battle. So, yeah, yeah, yes, maybe, yeah, maybe just to add to that, I mean, uh, I think, you know, and there is ever so much really the civil society can do and they cannot act alone. They have to have allies, especially here. And if we have here you mean Brussels? In, the, in Europe, in Europe, huh. right. So because, uh, uh, you know, democracy is indeed, as Karl Franz mentioned uh, in the case of media, this is really a drastic example. But democracy is backsliding in the region. And uh, this is a process that to a large extent caused by the enlargement fatigue, by the myth of the enlargement fatigue. I mean, I can talk, I can talk about it as both an Italian and Serbian. I know the malaise in the European Union of the citizens, uh, they fear the future, they fear the globalization, they are worried that they will not have pensions. And then we interpret that as uh, in some very superficial opinion polls as their hostility towards enlargement. Mm -hmm. But we do not have independent proof of that. We have not a lot of time before the end yes, of the program. Please. Could I ask you about the money? How much money do you spend in the Western Balkans in the recent years? And what's, what's the result that you have achieved? 
you, you start your figures are certainly more impressive than ours. <laughs> no, I, I, and I really no, and, then, and then there is an obvious question that everybody, I mean, especially the the, the people who are very uh, very hostile towards the, the 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 civil society and the foreign funds. What, what's the reason? To fund. What what would you reply to the ordinary, let's say, citizen, pro uh, oriented, pro-governmental, uh, in some of the uh, uh, Western Bal Balkan states, in Serbia, in Macedonia? Why you you are supporting financially with very important sum of money the civil society? And I think to answer correctly to that question, uh, I will speak not about the Western Balkans, but about the entire world. Because yeah. we are operating well, in more than 100 countries in the world. We do not have a specific agenda related to the Balkans. Uh, we work on public health, media freedom, education, justice, human rights, transparency, accountability. We are, uh, they, they call us the champion of yeah. lost causes, and we are really <laughs> proud of that, actually. And uh, how to explain think, to the ordinary citizen, I mean, why? I mean, somebody is spending the million. Because Macedonia, in Serbia, in Bosnia, in African countries, in Asia, yeah. everywhere in the I world. Think even to, a, help, to help, yeah. I think even uh, kind of hinted at that. I don't know if she was aware, but she said that uh, before uh, anybody else, you started uh, doing work in the Balkans. This is why. This is your answer. Yeah. Because we, we start somewhere where others are not working. I mean, I, by this, I don't mean our friends from the Erste Foundation, we work really closely together in the region, but I mean, I'm speaking globally. And yeah. I mean, I, I really, uh, I prefer not talking about the figures, but I can. We, in the last yeah. 30 years, probably uh, our foundation spent like $10 billion, but that, that's not really the point, because uh, uh, the point is the difference that you make at the grassroots level, and I think you know, the, we don't really need to talk about it. It shows for itself in the region. And Mr. Think, Connor, I think what's, what's what would be your, your answer to those people? Very quickly, when my answer is uh, because we care what is happening in the region. We care for a uh, development of a democratic, liberal society in the region because we believe that that is the best way for people being able to live together, uh, to contribute to participate uh, in the into in the life and the development of a society and this will bring the best results uh, in a society in terms of living together uh, in the, in a in a human uh, dignified way of being able to to do business in that region of um, fostering a political climate that brings out the best in people rather than the worst in people. And I think this is what we are concerned with also as a shareholder of a very large um, retail bank that is active in the region. Our concern must be with the society that is uh, the society in which this bank uh, and which other people are doing their economic uh, work, their economic businesses. And we care for people who are on the margins. This is our heritage, so to speak, our DNA. We were set up 200 years ago to bring people on the margins of society through financial service into the middle of society. And we were very successful with that 200 years. And now we do it in form of a foundation. We have spent in the last seven, last 10 years between 70 and 80 million euros in Central Eastern Europe. I can't give you the exact figures for the Western Balkan countries, but I think what, what is, as, as Sergian has been saying, what is for us the more important uh, of, uh, element than, than just the money element is the encouragement, the, 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 the backup that we are giving through this to people. Um, we have I've had many discussions with people from the cultural scene where we are supporting contemporary artists in, in many countries in the region who have said, without your support, without your encouragement, even if it wasn't huge in terms of financial uh, input, but without the, the recognition from your side, we would never have been able to go on. We would never have been able to last. The same is true for a lot of uh, NGOs in the civil society, social, social service sector who go without recognition doing fantastic work for people on the margin of society, but through the award that we have been giving for the last 10 years, uh, they have received public recognition, they have received uh, the, the esteem of people, and that carries them forward. This is, this is a moral boost that they receive, uh, which uh, I think is ex 
as important as giving financial support. Hope your message are going to be understood. <laughs> Mr. Problem, Mr. Chief, thank you so much for thank being you. our guest. Thank Thanks you very much. Jakovčić, you had to leave. Borjan, poštovani gledatelji, hvala vam što ste i danas bili uz emisiju Balkan u Evropi. Srdečno pozdrav. Bogodara za vnjima nijeta.